Thanks for downloading today's podcast of Clearly Seen, taught by Mike Kokoris. I think you're going to enjoy what Mike has for you today. And if you're ever in the San Fernando Valley area of Los Angeles, we invite you to Lindley Church. Mike would love to meet you personally and answer any questions you have. Feel free to email your comments and questions to michael at kokoris.com. Now, let's hear from Mike. This is the last message in a series on the Holy Spirit. If I covered all the areas that the scripture covers pertaining to the Holy Spirit, we could be here for quite a while. In the first message, I just touched on the fact that he's involved in creation of the earth. Matter of fact, the opening verses of Genesis mention his work. He was involved in the ministry of Christ. He was involved in the in inspiration of the scripture. But what I chose to do was focus on his work among believers. So, since this is the last message, one last time, I'm going to rehearse and review very quickly the work of the Holy Spirit in relationship to those who have trusted Christ for the gift of eternal life. What does he do? Well, in the first place, he gives us a new life, a spiritual life. And as I explained in this series, there are different levels of life. There are different kinds of life. There's plant life and there's animal life. There's human life. There's angelic life. And there's divine life. When a person trusts Jesus Christ, they are literally given a spiritual life. That's why we call it being born again, being born this time spiritually. So that's the first thing he does, and it's only the beginning. He actually takes up residence in us, so he indwells us. He seals us until the Lord comes back to redeem the body. He baptizes us into the body of Christ, which unites us to the Lord himself, and unites us to all other people who have trusted Christ. He then gives us a spiritual gift so that we are able to serve. He fills us with the word of God and the wisdom that comes from it. And he empowers us as we trust him to do the will of God, to do what God has told us to do. Now in that list is basically what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. But there's one more. One more that's usually not talked about. It's only rarely mentioned, but it is one of the most important works of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which is one of two passages that talk about this work of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to look at the last verse in chapter 3. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The work I have in mind is in this verse called the transformation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit transforms believers. Now, what does that mean? And what is involved? How does he do it? What must we do for him to do it? Well, all those questions are the kinds of things I want to answer in this message. And let me start by simply saying that the word transform simply means to change. That's all it means. It means to change from one form to another. Remember when Christ was transfigured? Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was changed from a human form into a divine manifestation. 
And that is transformation, change from one form to another. Now that's what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a person who has trusted Christ. Now you say, but is this is that what happens when we trust Christ? Aren't we changed? Didn't you just say he gives us life and indwells in us? And the answer is yes, all of that's true. That is called regeneration. That when we realize that Jesus Christ died for our sins and arose from the dead, and we trust him and what he did to get us to heaven, then we are regenerated which means he gives us new life, and that changes us. It changes us from being someone alienated from God, separated from God, to someone who is connected to the Lord himself. We are changed spiritually. Now, in some cases, those changes can be rather dramatically demonstrated, and in other cases, they aren't. But whether it is a gradual process or a dramatic process, it is a change. But that is not what 2 Corinthians 3.18 is talking about. It's talking about transformation, not regeneration. Now this is very important. At the moment you trust Christ, there's regeneration, and that is a change. But transformation is a process that goes on once you have done that to change you more and more into Christ-likeness. And that is what this is talking about. Look at the verse again. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. We're being changed to be like Christ as we behold the glory of the Lord, the manifestation of who he is, then we are changed from glory to glory. In other words, that little phrase describes a process of growth. Now there's all kinds of ways to express this in the Bible. One way, my favorite way, as a matter of fact, is to say when you're born again, you're a babe, spiritually. When you trust Christ, the Bible says we're babes. In other words, we're spiritually immature. And as the work of the Holy Spirit is accomplished in our lives, we are changed from glory to glory to glory. We grow spiritually to maturity. So another way to say the same thing is we grow from immaturity to maturity. But the point is, maturity is Christ-likeness. And that's what this verse is saying. We are transformed, changed, from glory to glory. The Lord's image is then perfected in us. So, we are changed. We are changed. We are literally changed changed. Let me illustrate. You ever heard, you've seen the bumper sticker, something about a random act of kindness? Is that part of being Christ-like? Kindness? Yes. Didn't we go over that last week? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Okay? Now, here's what's tricky. and It's very important. Anybody any time can do an act of kindness. Right? An unsaved person could be kind, right? Correct. But what happens in the life of a believer is that you are changed so that that kindness becomes part and parcel of who you are. It becomes part of your character. It's who you are. It's not just that, oh yeah, there's a, an emergency and I do an act of kindness. Or I adopt a slogan. I'm going to you know, do random acts of kindness. All of which is a good thing. I'm not knocking it. I'm simply saying that's not transformation. The transformation is when the Spirit of God 
so works in your life that that's who you become. It's your character. It's who you are. Now, my question today is, how do I get that done? How do I get that done? Well, actually, if you've listened to me for any time at all, you know what I'm going to say. There are a number of factors involved in uh, me being transformed. Uh, I've mentioned them time and time again. I think trials are part of that. James chapter 1 clearly teaches that when we trust the Lord in the midst of a trial, that we end up spiritually mature. That's the point of James chapter 1. Uh, there are other things involved. I think fellowshipping with other Christians is part of the process. Sitting under the teaching of the Word is part of the process. But in the final analysis, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to focus on. So what I want to know is, besides those other things I've mentioned, What's critical to me being changed? What do I have to do to be changed by the Lord himself? In answer to that, in answer to what the Holy Spirit does, I want to mention three things. The first is in this passage. The second is in another passage, which is the only other time that transformation is mentioned in the New Testament pertaining to a believer. And the third is in a third passage that doesn't talk about transformation, but it talks about growth. So, here we go. Ready? Well, let me ask this. You want to be changed? Yes. yes By the Holy Spirit? Yes. So that it's part of your character to be loving and joyful and kind and self-control, all those things. You want that? All right. Look at verse 18. He says, But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. Wow! Each word, every phrase is just pregnant with meaning. He says, beholding. That is the issue. You want to be changed? Here's what you have to do. Behold, look. Now, clustered around that are a number of phrases like with an unveiled face. Now, why did he say that? Where did that come from? In order to understand that phrase, you need to read this whole chapter. So let me just, we're not going to go through it, but let me quickly explain that in this chapter, Paul talks about the fact that Moses went up to the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, where he got the Ten Commandments. And he met with the Lord. And when he came down, the glory of the Lord was shining on his face. And the children of Israel couldn't look upon it. It was blinding. So Moses put a veil on his face. And that's the point of the whole chapter. And then he gets down to verse 18. Now with that in mind, read verse 18 again. But we all, with an unveiled face. Not just Moses, but we all. Now it's the privilege of all believers to see the Lord. But it's as in a mirror. Now the mirror is a reference to the scripture. So we don't look directly at the Lord. We look as if in a mirror. Only what's tricky about that is we look in a mirror and we don't see ourselves. We see the Lord. One more time. Look at verse 18. We look in a mirror and see the glory of the Lord. Ah. It's when we look in the scripture that we see the Lord. Now, I think that covers everything in the scripture in general and the Lord in particular. Is that talked about the fruit of the Spirit. I talked about the fact that in Ephesians 5, it's truth and righteousness. In Galatians chapter 5, it's love, joy, and peace. And those, those virtues sort of sum up what the Bible is after. What the Bible is really after is not making you religious. It's just not making you good. It's making you Christ-like. And Christ-like is being filled with truth and righteousness 
and love and joy and peace. That's what this book is about. That's what it's trying to do. And so it is as we behold the Lord who is those things that the Spirit of God works in our life and we become like that. Wow, that is really interesting. I could almost say it's like behind the scenes that he works and he transforms us from glory to glory. So it is not reformation that we need, it is transformation. Reformation comes about when there's some aspect of your life that you don't like and by your sheer will you decide that I'm going to change that. That happens. But that's not what the scripture is after. What the scripture is after is not just making bad people good, it's interested in making dead people alive, alive to God, and making them beyond that like Christ. And how do you get that? By some willpower? No. By beholding. The first thing you have to do is just behold. Make the Word and the Lord in it the focus, and you behold. Or to use another word that's saying the same thing, you contemplate the Lord. You contemplate the Word in general and the Lord in particular. And in that process, you are transformed. You are changed. Am I making sense? Yes. It's that simple? Yeah. Just focus on the Lord. Think about Him. And when you do, the Spirit of God works to change you to be like Him. That's what that verse is saying. Incredible. Let me put it like this. The Greek word translated transformed is the word from which we get the English word metamorphosis. And it's the word that's used of the process of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It changes. It's metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly. That's the change. So the change is that when we look at the Lord and contemplate Him, just thinking about Him, then the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to change us from caterpillars to butterflies. Amen. Now let me ask you a question. Are you a caterpillar or a butterfly? Or would you like to be a butterfly? Maybe that's a better question. All right, the way you get there is you just behold the Lord. Now, you look at that and you say, surely. That surely there's more to it than that. You just can't look and be changed. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I think there is a little more than that. It's embedded in verse 18, but it's stated clearly elsewhere. So turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Now, this passage you know You've heard many times, probably have it memorized, but let's look at it again. Romans 12, verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Ah, there's our word. This is only the second time it appears. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ah. That's the second thing we need to have happen. The first is in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and the word is just behold, just look, just look, contemplate, focus. But as you do that, what happens is you, your mind is renewed. Ah, that's the point. Your mind is renewed. Now, uh, there are several things we need to look at in this regard. And one is that the word mind here can mean your understanding, your reasoning, your thought. It can even mean purpose. 
But what is even more interesting is this. The word renew means to renovate. So, put these two things together. I'm looking at the Lord. I'm looking at the Word, and if this process is to work, I have to renew my mind. I have to change my mind. Or that word literally means renovate. Do you ever remodel a house? You renovate. Now, how do you do that? Well, my wife and I were talking about this this morning. And uh, I said, uh, help me here. And she said, well, you could redecorate the bathroom. You could, you know, put up, I guess, new curtains and put out new towels. But she said, if you renovate it, what you would have to do is gut the whole thing and just redo the whole thing, top to bottom, new fixtures. That is what Romans 12, 2 is talking about. Now, let me, let me go back and put this process together. Here's what happens. If, you have, if you're not a Christian, if you've never trusted Christ to get you to heaven, then according to the scripture, you're separated from God. You, you don't have a relationship with the Lord. So then you hear that Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid for your sin, arose from the dead, and you trust Christ. At that point, what happens? I've told you this several times. What happens? You get new life and he moves in. He moves in your old house. And guess what your old house needs? Renovation. So, Think of the house. So the Lord moves in, and you don't need to redecorate. You need to renovate. A whole bunch of things needs to change. Now, if you've ever remodeled a house, you know that doesn't get done overnight. It's from glory to glory. It takes a long time to get that done. So we're not talking about something that's done all at once. We're talking about a process. As a matter of fact, to emphasize that, in the Old Testament, God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you the land. Then he turns around and says, I'm going to give it to you little by little. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy 7.22 says, and the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little, and you will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beast of the field become too numerous for you. So I'm going to give you the land. It's yours. The house is yours. Now remodel it. And oh, by the way, that's going to take time. And then he says in Exodus chapter 23, and I will send hornets before you, which will drive out the Hittites, the Canaanites, and the Hivites before you. I will drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land be desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Ah, so it's a little by little, that all these things are changed. It's very slow. Matter of fact, let me pursue this for a bit. I think both 2 Corinthians 3.18 and Romans 12.2 are describing a process of beholding glory to glory, renewing, renovating, both which imply time. We got that much down? Yes. So let me suggest, as it was suggested to me a number of years ago by someone else, that the change may take place and you not even be aware of it. And I think that's what happens a lot. That we are slowly changed and we always, we always are not aware. I mean, when you were a kid, 
Remember you wanted to grow tall? You put the mark on the wall? And you were growing, but you weren't aware of the growth. But you were growing. I think that happens to, to Christians. We grow, and we're not always aware of it until something happens that makes us aware of it. This happened to me recently and kind of jolted me. As a matter of fact, it shocked me. Um, I have a doctor, a primary, who once a year gets a physical. But seven and a half years ago, as most of you know, I had a spinal cord injury, so I go see him a lot. He wants to see me. He likes me, apparently, so he wants to see me every three months to see how I'm doing. So I'm in that office a lot. My wife has a doctor in that office as well, so we both frequent that office a lot. Well, in, over the last seven years, I'm in and out of that office. I've gotten, I mean, it's pretty sad when you know everybody in a doctor's office by their first name. I mean, this is, you know, so I know the nurses and the office staff. And there's one girl that works in the office staff that Patricia and I have both commented. She's just a little sweetheart. She's as sweet as she can be. Everybody just loves her. You can't help but love her. So months ago, I was in the doctor's office for one of these routine three-month checkups or whatever it is. And, and I'm always kidding around with there's several girls behind the desk, and I was joking around with them. And I found out that this one girl that Patricia and I have sort of focused on before was engaged to get married. But she didn't have anybody perform the service. And I said just flippantly, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and she pounced on that, and before I knew it, I was drafted to perform their wedding before I knew any of the details. Then I found out the details. They were getting married in Oxnard on the beach. Now, I can do very well walking on something solid. But walking on sand is another problem. Now, there happens to be in that office a male nurse. And I said to him on one of my visits, you going to the wedding? The whole office was going to the wedding. i never seen so many doctors at a wedding in my life. And uh, I said, you're going to have to help me walk out on that sand. He said, no problem. So the wedding was two weeks ago. And Patricia and I went to the wedding. Matter of fact, Patricia ended up being the wedding coordinator. <laughs> and had she not been there, I'm not sure how much of a wedding we would have had. But anyway, uh, I had to go walk, and it was quite a distance. And I had to walk out on the sand, and they had set up a tent. Now, that tent was only big enough for me, the bride, and the bridegroom. The wedding party had to be outside the tent. And it was due to start at 3 o'clock. So... Uh, about 15 minutes to 3, I found my male nurse, and Lou, you got to walk me out. And he walked me out very gently, and we got there, and my doctor, who was sitting already sitting there, uh, came up, and, and they had put a piece of plywood down so I could stand on it because I couldn't stand in the sand. And the doctor said, why don't we put you in a chair? Great idea. So they got one of the chairs. They had two little section of chairs with an aisle for the wedding party to come down. So they put a chair under this little tent, and I sat there, waiting for the wedding to start. I'm early. Three o'clock, no wedding party. 3.15, no wedding party. 3.30, no wedding party. 3.45, no wedding party. Four o'clock, no wedding party. My doctor gets out of his seat, walks up to me, and says, can you do a wedding in four minutes? And I said, huh? I've never done one in four minutes. Why do I need to do it? He said, I've been here since 2 o'clock. He was getting a little impatient. Shortly after that, the wedding party showed up, and we had a wedding. And he, after the wedding, I thought to myself, huh, I wasn't impatient. You've got to be kidding. I'm a, this must be a dream. Do you know how impatient I am? 
I'm very impatient. But I sat there for an hour and 20 minutes, and it never occurred to me, well, they'll get here when they get here. Sat there in that little tent in that little chair by myself, just me and the Lord. And then it dawned on me, I think I've become a more patient. I hesitated to ask my wife, but I think I've become, <laughs> she's shaking her head, yes, so I passed. But really, I, especially in the last five years, I think, I think I have become more patient and wasn't aware of it until the doctor said, can you do a wedding in four minutes? <laughs> and that's what happens, isn't it? You just think about the Lord and you think about the scripture and the, the Holy Spirit does the work and you are just different. That's all. You're just different. Now, you're more like Christ. That's the idea. Now, let's look at Romans 12, 2 again. In order to put this into focus, I'd like to look at the whole passage for a second. Verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, a lot of people use this verse to say there needs to be some kind of dramatic experience called a crisis. Uh, crisis usually has a negative connotation. And theologically, it's just used of a, of a dramatic experience. And that at that point on, you de dedicate your life to Christ. Well, I don't doubt that people go through that experience. I do doubt that this verse is talking about that. And that's why I wanted to bring this up. This is a reference to Romans 6, where in Romans 6, Paul argues that you present your body as an instrument of either righteousness or unrighteousness. In other words, Romans 12, 1 is not talking about some crisis experience, uh, dramatic experience. It's talking about a process of obedience. Clearly, clearly spelled out in Romans chapter 6. No question about that. So then he says, look, here's what you need to do. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. God has been merciful to you. He freely gave you eternal life. So because he did that, what you need to do is just use your body to serve him. Obey him. And don't be conformed to this world. It's the second thing he says. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now I want to focus on that. Don't be conformed for a second. Don't be conformed to the world. The word translated world here actually means age. Don't be conformed to this age. Don't be conformed to the fad of the moment. That's the idea. Now, what's the fad of the moment? What's the, what's the spirit of the age right now? Boy, could we talk about that for the rest of the afternoon. Um, you know, Patricia and I again were discussing this, and she suggested, oh, technology. And we're all conformed to it. You have a smartphone? Let me tell you what the smartphone has taught me, how dumb I am when it comes to technology. So I get aggravated with this thing, and I say to Patricia, go find a five-year-old and tell him to come here and help me. <laughs> but you notice how everybody's glued to this thing? I mean, I love it. I don't know what I'd do without it. Do you know what all is in here? Are you aware? There's, I mean, this is, I'm not exaggerating. This is true. There's more technology in my little iPhone right here than there is, than there was in the rocket ship that sent the men to the moon the first time. There's more technology in my hand right here. Wow. Yeah. So we're glued to it. Patricia told a story of going to a restaurant and seeing a family of four, mother, father, two kids. Probably had a little station wagon out front and a picket fence or throw around their yeah. house. And they're all glued to the phone. And she watched them and said, they were glued to the phone the whole time. Never spoke to each other. Now, folks, that's a problem. We're being conformed to this world. We're so glued to the technology, we don't, we don't interact with each other. 
How many friends do you have on Facebook? Hundreds, right? How many of them do you meet face to face and have an honest to goodness, intimate, personal relationship with? Not many. So here's the issue. Are you being conformed to this world? Are you being transformed by the renewing of your mind? You see, Jesus said, the greatest commandment was that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, and you know the verse, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Another way to say that is that what life is about is relationships. Amen. That you have a relationship with the Lord and you have a relationship with other people. And what we are doing is we're being conformed to the age of technology and we are not developing relationships. So families can go to dinner and not talk to each other. I submit to you, the next generation is going to pay for this. And the bill is going to be expensive. And it's not going to be pretty. Because what life is about is developing relationships. So don't be conformed to the world that divides and hinders the development of relationships. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that says, I'm going to be like Jesus Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. That's the point of the Gospel of Mark. I didn't come to be served. I came to be a servant. Relationships. People. So here's the process. The process is, I behold the Lord in a mirror, meaning the Word. And secondly, I renew my mind. I say, you know what? I'm not going to be conformed to the age I'm going to be transformed by the scripture. That's the process. And in the background, the Holy Spirit is changing you little by little from glory to glory until you become more and more like Jesus Christ. And it becomes part of who you are, not just a random act of kindness. You could have a random act of kindness and be an angry person. You can't be conformed to Christ and be an angry person. Wow. How are we doing? This good stuff? Not my sermon, the text. Right? And I said I had three points, I got one more. And it's short and sweet. So, all I have to do is just focus on the Lord and in the process change my mind. Yep, that's it. Right? Now that's assuming that you're going to obey the Lord. Romans 12, 1 is before quote verse 2. And you're going to trust him to do all that. I've explained all that in this series. But let me tell you what's the bottom, bottom line. Second Peter chapter 2. I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby since you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. The first word today is behold. The second word is renew. And the third word is desire. You know what the bottom line is? You got to desire this. You got to desire this. Jesus said at one point, if any man desires to come after me, and he laid out some requirements. I think desires, I think the, the issue is what do you want? Years ago, I met a pastor who's a dear friend of mine till this day, and he said to me, Mike, people do what they want to do. That's as insightful a psychological insight as I've ever seen. You know what? We do what we want to do. So the bottom issue is, what do you want? If you want to be like Christ, that's the issue. Then you will spend time contemplating him. You will spend time renewing your mind. 
And that gives the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work. So the bottom, bottom line is, what do you want? To con be conformed to the world and be like everybody else? Or to be like Christ? Oh, can I say that again? Yes. Do you want to be conformed to the world so you're like everybody else? Or do you want to be conformed to Christ? And here's the formula. Behold, focus, concentrate on Him. And in the process of doing that, renew your mind so that you begin to think like Him. My favorite way of saying this is learn to think biblically. But it all comes down to do you desire? So, here's the issue. As believers, behold the glory of the Son of God in the Word of God. The Spirit of God changes them into Christ-like spiritual maturity. In Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul in verse 19 says, I labored among you till Christ be formed in you. That's it. That you become Christ-like. That it becomes part of the fabric of your being. It's who you are. Not conforming to those around you. Conforming to Christ in you. The renewing of your mind. Amen. Amen. Finest illustration I know of this is something that I've used before, but I've never found a better illustration, so I'm going to use it again. Years ago, there was a situation in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. High on one of the rocky walls protruded a granite formation that resembled the profile of an old man looking in the valley below. By the way, that, that was actually true. There was, if you were in the valley and looked up, there was a protrusion in the rock and it looked like the face of a man looking in the valley. It is no longer there. In May of 2003, uh, it crumbled, and you can't see the face anymore. But it was there for years. As a matter of fact, Nathaniel Hawthorne used it to write a story called The Old Man of the Mountain. How many of you have ever heard the story, Old Man of the Mountain? Oh, good. Only two of you. <laughs> Great then you will appreciate the story. Let me tell you the story. Uh, based on this rock formation called the Legend of the Great Stone Face. According to the story, there was a boy named Ernest and lived in the valley below the Great Stone Face. His mother told him about an ancient legend. She said, someday a man will arise, born in the neighborhood, whose countenance will resemble the great stone face which you see on the side of that distant mountain. As Ernest looked, he saw in the rock what appeared to be the features of a fine and noble man. From that time in his early years, he spent time concentrating on that sight. He longed for the day when he could see a real face as kind and as wise as the one that appeared in the rock. Carefully, he scrutinized individuals within the village. Now this is Nathaniel Hawthorne writing a fiction story, you understand. He scrutinized Mr. Gather Gold. Clever. General Blood and Thunder. And one called the poet. Each time, however, he was disappointed, yet he never became discouraged in his search, cheerfully performing his duties daily and always looking to help others. Over the years, 
He gained, gained the respect and the admiration of all who knew him. One evening, as the sun was setting, suddenly a man called the poet pointed to the fella and said, Look, there's the man who resembles the great stone face. After looking at the image in the mountain and looking for an individual who bore the resemblance, Ernest had become like the great stone face. Oh, love it. Oh, hear me. As we look at the Lord, see his face in the word behind the scenes. If you desire it and begin to think like it, the Spirit of God will transform you into being like Christ. And that's what I desire for all of us. Father, thank you for giving us your Son, your Word, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, may the Spirit of God impress upon us the need to cooperate with him so that we can become more and more like your Son. Father, that's my prayer. For all of us in this congregation, that we would reflect the righteousness and love of you. In Jesus' name.